And gentlemen, it is now 7 o'clock. I would like to call the order, call to order the March 9th, 2020, uh, regular board meeting of the Othello School Board of Directors. We will commence tonight with the flag salute. Once again, I want to welcome everybody who's in attendance tonight. Uh, I'd say I, I'd like to see this every school night, but we'd want to run into a problem and have to hold it somewhere else. But glad everyone's here. Si alguien ocupa servicio de traducción con los audífonos, la, la señora Alicia acá en la esquina está para, para ayudarlos. Um, having said that, uh, thank you for being here. I will entertain a motion for the approval of tonight's agenda. I would actually like to move and make some changes. Um, from C1, let's see. I would like to take C1-6 and move it to C2 and take C1-8 and move it to C3 and then the others fall in line in the appropriate number. I don't know what to say there. Renumber everything else. All right. Any other modifications need to be made to tonight's agenda? Okay, we have a motion by Director Stevenson to modify the agenda with the removal or the, the change of item C1-6 to C2, make it its own item, C1-8 to C3, therefore making the others uh, four and five in C. Second. I have a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries five to zero. Um, before we move on tonight, and I realize that we, we do have a busy, busy agenda, there is an announcement I'd like to make and a an ask of everyone that's here tonight. I will read this statement and, and we shall proceed. Jim Davis, former administrator at McFarland Junior High. Scutney Springs Elementary and Hiawatha Elementary passed away last week. Jim's entire 30-year career in education was here in the Othello School District. He began as a sixth grade teacher in 1960, a job he acquired from attending a job fair. He spent most of his career, 22 years, as a principal, as principal at McFarland Junior High. Jim was known for being supportive, supportive of his staff and for being accessible to staff, parents, and students. He retired to the Ellensburg Clealum area in 1990. I would like us to observe a moment of silence in remembrance of Mr. Jim Davis, please. Thank you very much. Uh, moving on, we have public comment tonight. Those of you that turned in your forms, uh, we will call your name. Uh, if you'll step up to the microphone, have a seat if you'd like. Uh, speak clearly into the microphone so those that aren't here tonight that are uh, listening via YouTube can hear your comment. Uh, you can direct your questions to the board and we will uh, respond with a response if possible tonight. If not, the appropriate personnel or proper person will be getting back to you with answers to your questions. Mike, should we ask the rest of the people to come in? If there are more in the hallway that want to come in and stand on the sides, yes, you are more than welcome. A bunch. But there are some chairs too. Yeah, if, if, we, if those in the hallway want to come in, yes, please do. chairs up front too. There's two on this side and there's one on that. Another one up front on this side. All right. 
right. Very good. Yeah, and if someone can keep an eye and more people want to walk in, yeah, absolutely. Okay, tonight we have Mr. Mark Rowley. Rowley, sorry about that. If you could state uh, your name and your address for the record, please. Hi, my name is Mark Rowley. I live at 1128 South Booker Road. Uh, thank you for the moment to comment. Um, <clears throat> my wife and I are here attending and, um, and hope that uh, there is some discussion and clarification on our district's position on the sex education bill that has been passed out of our legislature this week. And I don't know if our uh, governor has signed it today or not. I haven't heard that. But um, I am abhorred by this action of our government. And I strongly, strongly urge the board to consider any possible way of not adopting this new curriculum. I think it is abhorrent of the things that are taught, the thing at the ages that they're taught, and the suggested curriculums that have been, that have been caught, been proposed. Um, I hope that each of the directors of the board um, can sincerely and, and adamantly look. I have not been able to find um, the information of how you can do that or not, and so I guess I'm interested if you know if that's possible to opt out as a district or not. Okay. I know there will be a report when uh, our board member discussion comes up. Representative Stevenson has some information for us. Uh, I don't know if that particular answer is there, but we'll... We'll all listen to what she's got to say. Thank you. Angie Pruneda. I'll, I'll, I'll wire the same information he had. Okay. Erica Gomez. Okay, this is, <laughs> I'm nervous. <laughs> um, Erica Gomez, uh, 533 South 5th. And it's basically the same thing. We just want it clarified on the sex education. Um, just recently, I called the high school to opt my daughter out of a certain cur curriculum. And um, I wasn't aware that was gonna be taught. And I was told that her GPA might drop because of that if she has opted out. And so I just want clarification on that. Okay. So because of this curriculum or a different class? It's it's a mandatory class. Her, her health class is mandatory right now, but there's a certain um, chapter chapter okay. that I don't want taught to her, and so they said that um, she might not be able to opt out because there is a long-term sub or something like that, and so I would like that clarified. Okay. Someone will get back to you with a with a response. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you for those comments. Um, tonight, we have one of the main reasons why a lot of the, with a lot of the kids are here tonight. We're gonna be recognizing some outstanding achievement of students. Uh, so we're gonna try to do this as efficiently as we can. We got a whole list of you. I'm actually gonna turn my computer around so I don't lose my place in line here. But as you hear your name uh, being called, please come on up and uh, shake our hands. Let us congratulate you and get your certificate if you would, please. So I'll ask the board to go up front. Elbow bumps, yeah, okay, <laughs> if, if that makes you feel better. Uh, some of these students, you're actually, there's a, you got a couple certificates coming your way. We'll do these individually. Uh, we got a couple categories here. So uh, first off, that better be Jesus. <laughs> I'm joking. Academic All-State Boys, um, Jackson Rocha. Uh, 
I'm going to butcher this. Liddell Giles. Yep. <laughs> Isaiah Perez. Arturo Solorio. <laughs> Eric Gomez. Good job. And Eliza Roy Lance. Academic All-State Girls, Emily Mendez. Iaceli Barraza. Mercedes Gonzalez. Wrestling State participants, boys, fifth place as a team. Uh, tonight we have Fa Forrest Roylance. <laughs> Josue Solorio. <laughs> Jonathan Gomez. Jackson Rocha. <laughs> Eliza Roy Lance. <laughs> Arturo Solorio once again. And the 2020 Wrestling State Champion, Isaiah Perez. <laughs> Wrestling uh, State Participants for the girls, also a fifth place uh, as a team. Uh, Alexis Monday. Guys, I'm sorry, I, I didn't mention your guys' placement, but uh, Alexis was fourth place. Iaceli Barraza, second place. Emily Mendez, res wrestling state champion. And we have our unified uh, basketball state participants, uh, Mr. Josh Lemke. Nathan Ruzma. Brandon Cusks. Jerónimo Villarreal. Sandra Montejano. Vincent Montejano. Brian Gomez. Michael Pruneda. Go. April Pruneda. <laughs> Dwayne.
Dulce Medina. Valerie Parra. And Jess Van Landingham. Just want to congratulate each and every one of you for the excellent effort. Um, we want to give a chance tonight to the boys wrestling coach, the girls wrestling coach, and if the unified coaches are here for their uh, team, would you please come on up and say a few words just, just to hear uh, about your programs and, and everything good that happened this year. All right, so first of all, congrats to the boys. Uh, placers, we had Elijah Roylance, who was seventh place. Um, Jackson Rocha was seventh place. Arturo Solorio, second place. And then Isaiah is actually the first heavyweight three-time state champion in history at, in Washington State. Um, And I'd say it, it was a fun season. These guys are a lot of fun. Uh, I felt like we had a lot of support with, within our uh, admin at the high school. I always felt like we had support in our athletic director along with the school board. It was, it was nice seeing guys. Uh, it was nice for the guys to see people showing up in the stands and supporting and watching. Um, so we, we're just really thankful with, um, with everything. We feel like we have a lot of support. I like to thank my coaches. Uh, I got some here. So Wayne Schutte, you can give him a hand. <laughs> uh, Ruben Lopez is not here. My dad, Rudy Ochoa. <laughs> Sammy Rocha is not here. Uh, Edgar Mendez. <laughs> and, and Jacob Johnston, who's also not here. So I'm, I'm surrounded. I'm lucky to be surrounded by an excellent supporting staff that makes everything just run really smooth. So as a whole, it was a great season. I appreciate the support. I appreciate you guys recognizing us. And another thing I, I just want to end on, if, if you could scroll up to the academic side. So we had six, six academic All-State. And Liddell Giles was the academic All-State champion. So Liddell Giles was the academic All-State champion. <laughs> Jackson Rocha, this is his second time, so he's back to back. So this, this group of guys, they work really hard in the wrestling room, along with in school, and we're just really proud of them. Thank you. All right, I'm Russell Reese, the girls um, head coach. Uh, we had, um, uh, yeah, we're just pretty proud of the girls. We took a big mistake. Okay. All right. So I'm Rafael Ruiz, uh, the girls' head coach, and um, yeah. So for academics, we had three honorable mentions, um, no state champions, but um, but these work. Uh, these girls worked pretty hard, and we had a pretty tough season. Uh, we had a lot of things that we had to deal with, but we finished fifth at state, uh, and that speaks uh, volumes uh, about the team. Uh, we took three girls, and all three girls wrestled really hard, um, and earned their place on the podium. So that was something that we're really proud of. Um, and um, yeah, we're looking forward to next year. We have a pretty good team returning as well. And um, and yeah, so if you see them around, congratulate them. And um, yeah, we're just very proud of them. And I'm very thankful for my uh, staff as well. We have Mark De La Rosa. <laughs> and um, the other assistant couldn't be here tonight, um, but uh, Lupe Perez, he's. And I just want to say thank you to everyone that supports uh, our wrestling team. And I mean, we have a pretty strong community that that stands behind it. And um, we continue to push forward and really do our best to give these girls a chance to participate in a sport that um, you know not very many girls come out to be part of. So 
Um, yeah, I just applaud them. I applaud them for continuing to wrestle hard through this tough season. And we're just really excited for next year. So, thank you. All right, uh, the unified basketball coach is not here, but oh, we do have a representative here. Awesome, yes. I don't see them here, but I just wanted to thank the um, coaches who were um, supportive of the unified basketball teams. Um, if you haven't been to a unified basketball game, you're um, you're you're in for a fun time of watching um, students play together and really respecting one another and. Um, it was a great season. They they worked really hard. We lost the last game just by one point, um, but to see the respect of um, our students showing other students and um, working together, it's it's kind of watching lifelong skills being developed, working together to um, accomplish a goal. So good job, team. Thank uh, special thanks to our coaches. Um, um, Kevin McDonald, I want to say Travis, Kevin McDonald, um, Julian, and, and Vanessa. So, thanks. All right, thank you. Uh, students, if you want to stay for the rest of the meeting, you're welcome to. If not, that gives room to a bunch of people in the hallway. in her report that she, she might give us. Yeah. yeah, those in the hallway, there's plenty of room inside now. <laughs> okay, moving on tonight. Um, we have our board member discussion. And I think the majority of you, or most of you, are here to, to listen to our legislative, legislative representative, Jen Stevenson, with some information on the sex ed bill. Uh, I want to applaud Jen for uh, taking, on, take this, taking on this. And uh, uh, I'm sure her information is uh, important to all of us. So if we could pay attention, uh, I think uh, we're going to learn a lot tonight. So take it away, Jen. Do you have the stuff I sent ahead? Okay. Um. Let's start with the top one. Can you go into that top one? And there'll be a lot of stuff I'm moving you all around for. Um, so. This is from the Washington State Legislature, and it shows the different statuses of different bills. Um, this bill became an engrossed substitute from the Senate bill. Um, it's 5395. Can you scroll up just a bit? So um, it has passed the Senate, and then it passed in the House, and then because of so many changes that was made, um, which is basically everything in the bill. It had to go back and repass the Senate, so it should have a passed legislature. I'm not sure why not there. It is currently um, up to the governor. So can you scroll up? Keep scrolling. There's some stuff way down here. Okay, here are all the amendments. Can you click on columns? Oh, it has them all. Okay, your screen's much bigger than mine. All right, these are all the amendments to the bill. Can you just start scrolling down so you can see there was tons and tons of amendments from lots of different people. 
Almost all of those say not adopted or withdrawn except for two. So keep going. There's still tons and tons of them. Um, there was only two that were accepted. Then we're going to go to um, the bills originally written. Just so you can see it, um, what different details are and stuff that was, who sponsored it maybe um, is the most important part on this one. Okay, then we're going to go to the next one. And then this is how it was adopted with all of its modifications. So it shows you um, the Committee on Education is who made all of these modifications and then the date it was adopted just so you can know and understand how to read all the different things. If you go into any of the other amendments, you could actually have clicked on any of those lines and it would say not adopted or withdrawn and a date. So after um, the clause just saying this is what it is, it changed everything. So we're going to read, I'm going to read quite a bit of this. So, um, in accordance with requirements of this section, every public school shall, I'm not going to read everything because there's like nine pages, just the detail, the important parts. Um, requirements of this section, every public school shall provide comprehensive sexual health education to every student by the 2022-23 school year. The curriculum instruction and materials is used to provide the comprehensive sexual health education, must be medically and scientifically accurate, age appropriate, and inclusive of all students regardless of their protected class status under chapter 49.60 RCW, and there are definitions at the end of this, that's why it adds like extra pages, and must include information about abstinence and other methods of preventing unintended pregnancy and sexually transmitted diseases. Abstinence may not be taught to the exclusion of other materials and instruction on contraceptives and disease prevention. Okay, then we're gonna go down to B. The school district board of directors or of one or more public schools that are not providing comprehensive sexual health education in either the 2019-20 school year, the 2021 school year, or both must prepare for incorporating information about affirmative consent and bystander training into the comprehensive sexual. So we have to do it by those years, basically. Uh, we're gonna go down to C. Um, comprehensive sexual health education must be consistent with the Washington State Health and Physical Education K-12 learning standards and the January 2005 guidelines for sexual health information and disease prevention developed by the Department of Health and the Office of the Superintendent of Public Instruction. We're going to look at that a little bit later, but these um, requirements, guidelines is the right word, have been in effect since January of 2005. Um, and then under 2A, it says, um, starting with 21-22, all grades 6 through 12. B says 22-23, all public school students. Um, and C says how often, um, once to students in kindergarten through grade three, once to students in grades four through five, twice to students in grades six through eight, and twice to students in grades nine through 12. Um, section three says OSPI, which stands for um, Office of Superintendent of Public Instruction. So I'm just going to shorten that to OSPI every time we come across that. Um, says that there's learning standards on their website. Four says they have to list curriculum on their website and update it annually. Um, and they have to review it and revise it, the training materials for it. 6A says public schools are encouraged to review their comprehensive sexual health education curricula and choose a curriculum from the list developed under subsection four of this section. Any public school may identify, choose, or develop any other curriculum if it complies, complies with the requirements of this section. Um, under B, it says if you pick a curriculum that's not on the list, if it uh, fits all of those requirements from the January 2005, it still counts. 7A, right there. Any parent or legal guardian who wishes to have his or her child excused from any planned instruction 
in comprehensive sexual education. Education blah, blah, may do so upon filing a written request with the school district. Don't file it with us. There's a, there's a process. There's already forms for opting out your child. Um, they've always been offered. Uh, B of the same section says that we have to notify you when it will take place. Um, lot of more information, downward to 10. Nothing in this section expresses legislative intent to require that comprehensive sexual health education or components of comprehensive sexual health education be integrated into curriculum, materials, or instruction in unrelated subject matters or courses. So then it goes into details of definitions under 11. Let's go to part B. Comprehensive sexual health education means recurring instruction in human development and reproduction that is age appropriate and inclusive of all students, regardless of their protected class status. All curriculum instruction and materials must used in providing comprehensive sexual health education must be medically and scientifically accurate and must use language and strategies that recognize all members of protected classes. Comprehensive sexual health education for students in kindergarten through grade three must be instruction in social emotional learning that is consistent with learning standards and benchmarks adopted by the Office of the Superintendent of Public Instruction. Um, grades four through five through 12 have other information. Okay, now we're gonna go back to the last report. Okay, this is the thing that they came out with in January of 2005. There are lots of different sections to this. They all have different colors. So we're gonna scroll down to sexual education. It's like light, it's like teal-ish. It's next, after nutrition. There we go. So here is where you can find the specific details for which grades, what they want to be taught for all of the different grades. Uh, for kindergarten, let's just look at that one. Understand boys and girls have some body parts that are same and some that are different. Growth and development. Understand living things grow and mature. Okay, can you scroll up? Reproduction. Developmentally appropriate outcomes first appear in grade two. And then in grade two, understand living things can reproduce. And grade three is understand humans can reproduce. Uh, all of HIV prevention all starts at grade four. Okay, if you can, then still under the kindergarten section, self-identity, understand there are many ways to express gender, healthy relationships, recognize characteristics of a friend. Still in kindergarten, recognize ways to express feelings, identify safe and unwanted touch, recognize people have the right to refuse giving or receiving unwanted touch. I think, will you scroll just a little bit more? I think that then it jumps to grade six. Um, so, I'm typically not in front of people like that. So, um, Currently, our school district uses what's called the FLASH curriculum in fifth and sixth grade. It's done that since 2007. It's always been an option to opt out. We have always followed the guidelines from since 2005 for that. Um, we already teach social emotional learning to kindergartners through grade three. Our district started that this year, and those are um, talking most of the things at the end, talking about friends and um, those kinds of things. Uh, some of the stuff that I've read on Facebook recently uh, that I just wanted to address. The state and federal government have always made education changes. It's our job as citizens to be aware and know what those changes are and to know who our reps are. Um, I think that it's easy for all of us to believe everything that we read even if George Washington wrote it on the internet. Um, the district, our district has always has community and parent input in all curriculum. 
Um, but if you've always planned on opting your child out of the curriculum, then maybe it's not something that you should ask to be a component of the curriculum. It's like saying, I want to be a part of making this hymn book, yet I don't go to your congregation. Um, so if you're planning on opting your child out, maybe going, being a part of the curriculum committee is not the best thing. You can always see what the curriculum is um, at any time. There, let's see, her name is. I have it in my little documentation here somewhere. Dorothy Martinez uh, here in the district office between the hours of 8.30 and 3.30 p.m. But it does say very specifically on the opt-out form, you do not have to preview materials in order to opt your child out of all or part of the curriculum. We've always called um, grades four through six sensitive issues. The way that the state has changed the name to comprehensive sexual education is a bit inflammatory um, from my views, but the board, a local school board, always approves the curriculum for the district. If we're not approving curriculum that you're happy with, then we're not representing you well and you should vote us out. Uh, the district, so, we, already are, we are already doing all of these things that this new bill is saying that we have to do because we're picking appropriate curriculum for our community. We're a highly Christian community. I know that we're a highly Christian board as well. We all are here because we love not only our own children but the children of this community. And if we were to do something that is abhorrent or outrageous, then again, we're not representing you well. Um, and in terms of just the sex ed bill, that's what I have to say. Any other comments by any of the board members? I would, I would encourage everyone just to continue reading on it. Um, there, we don't have any concrete answers, as you can deduct from, from, from Jen's presentation. Uh, I do know that you have you got to fill out this piece of paper, and you will never hear about what this is or, or, or what it was for your child. Um, I think Jen did a good job of uh, describing our intent, uh, our non-willingness to, to approve something that does not go with the values of this community. Um, there will never be a silver, sil silver bullet answer that's going to be pleasing to everybody. We all should recognize that. Uh, although I have no more children in this district, and my grandchildren will probably never come to the Othello School District, I, I spend the time that I do and volunteer this time because I care about each and every one of the kids that, that are in this community. And the last thing I need is for the wrong cu curriculum, especially with such a delicate subject, to be... Uh, forced on anyone, and, and that, is not the, that, that is not the intent of the state, I don't believe, or of this district. Uh, the fact that there's an opt-out uh, gives us the opportunity, or you, the opportunity as parents, to opt out of this. Um, I, would, uh, I know that I made a phone call, and they were going to send my, uh, my intent before the vote happened to, to our local representatives. Um, I don't know if the, gov if the governor signed this or not. I, I, I haven't read that anywhere today. I'm not sure. Um, I do know that Othello isn't the only community that is against this. I know that I have seen a lot of, of people up in arms uh, over this bill, the way it was done uh, at 2 in the morning with none of the amendments being even considered. Um, so I would, I, would, I would encourage that we continue to educate ourselves on, on what is in this. And at the end of the day, like Jen says, uh, if uh, th there's some things that the state's going to mandate that we really, as a school board or, or as a district, have no control over. But uh, I'd like to, uh, to Mr. Ra Rowley's uh, comment. Rowley. Rowley. Oh, I am so sorry, Mark. Um, if there is anything uh, 
that the board can can do. I, I think we'll explore that. Um, the last thing I, we need, like I said, is to have something out here where you guys are going to say, you know, let's get these, let's vote them out, like Jen just said, because they did this to us. Uh, none of it would be with the intention of harming anyone. There are some things that we have to abide by, whether we like them or not. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, you as the parent have the option to opt out of these programs. I would just say, like anything, there's bad information out there that comes on both sides. So just be really careful where you're getting your information and recognizing that really nothing in our district for the majority part is going to change. This is, we've already been doing these things. And so just be careful with like mass hysteria with what you can find online with people making something out of what to, to what our community is going to find is nothing changes. I did not have the answer for um, the, let me, if you're in health and want to opt out of a sex ed section, so that will have to come eventually from the district level. All right, moving on, uh, we need to schedule our next uh, facilities meeting. I know, Jen, you had requested that we wait till you were done with Sand Hill Crane Festival, just because you're real busy with that, and I know most of us are very busy. So if we can pull out our calendars. How much time do we have to vote on this sex education stuff? We don't. We don't. There is no vote on it. They, they, they can. Mike, I think that we're at planning a facility meeting. Yeah. Okay. Yes, if you'd like to, if you'd like to speak to us individually at some other time, please, please bring your comments. Um, but, but yes, absolutely willing to listen. So, Jen, when is Sand Hill Crane Festival? Is it the 21st? 20 through the 22nd. Okay. We have been doing some Wednesdays. Do we want to do the 25th? We already have a meeting on the 23rd. Um, or we could do the 30th. What's, what's the preference? A Monday or a Wednesday, guys? The 25th won't work. Okay. I won't be just getting back from D.C. that day. Okay. okay. Monday the 30th? 30th works for me. And Sharon, I just have to make it work. <laughs> okay, so Monday the 30th, uh, 6 p.m. Yep. We will just plan on having our next facilities workshop. Just while you guys are all here, we really need your input for facilities. So if you can come back on March 30th to our facilities meeting, that would be great. Or talk to one of the board members about the direction you want the district to take or any sort of ideas or all of the above. All righty, so the 30th will be our next board meeting, 6 to 8 p.m. here at the district office, here at the boardroom. Uh, moving on. Um, we need to discuss our Lee property uh, land lease. It is up for release if we choose to. I would like to hear where we all stand on that uh, and make a decision. I'd like to see us sell it, put it up for sale. Okay. Otherwise, the revenue that we don't have to look at other options is not there. I'm with Sharon. There's not a path forward for the district in that land, so no point in renting it for pennies. Yeah, and, and my I, I, I think we're all in, on accord with this, and it has nothing to do with uh, 
the not wanting to lease this if, if and when we decide to put this up for sale. I just don't want to have, well, we got to wait to the potential buyer who's got money in hand and we're going to have to say, well, let's wait till this crops out or, or whatever it is if we did went ahead and lease it. So I would rather that we just not renew this lease and initiate the process. And um, even with the easement with Cascade Gas that we're going to be discussing later, it, I'm sure that that would affect him in, anyways. Potential buyer. And that's for sure coming forward right away, yeah. whether the buyer's... I mean, it could still take five years to sell it. Who knows? But Okay. So if you'll uh, notify Turk Gold, Chris, that we will not be uh, renewing their lease for, for that property. Okay, moving on. Student representative reports. Okay. Good afternoon. Evening. It's evening. Good, I <laughs> good evening. <laughs> So for the preschool, um, so last week was Read Across America, and so the students dressed up as different Dr. Seuss characters and read stories all week. And on Friday, they had um, McFarland students from Mrs. Cooper and Mr. Howell's class come read to the preschoolers. Um, they also had Jen come visit the preschool and share some information about the Sand Hill Crane Festival. And then they had Warren Fields from the Public Library um, visit and share some stories with the preschoolers. Um, at Scootney, they have, they've been having a Pennies for Patients fundraiser. This is their last week of that. So they basically just collected, collected coins and they are being donated to the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society to support cancer patients in our community. And so far they've collected $2,000 in donations. They're also having um, a books for breakfast event this year. I'm not sure when that is, but I can find out. Wednesday. It's Wednesday, I guess. <laughs> um, and so this year, they're also having their parents visit the students' classrooms to read with them. At Hiawatha, they're competing. that off. Okay. At Hiawatha, they are competing, or they're completing their ELPA testing, and they also just finished. Um, Dr. Seuss Read Across America Week, and they had a kickoff assembly and dress up days. At Ludacaga, they are starting their ELPA 21 testing, and they're having combined specials on the 10th to create art for the Sand Hill Crane Festival. They're also celebrating their classified staff with a superhero theme. At Wahidis, they also celebrated Read Across America Week. They also had dress up days, and they did door decorations and had grade level buddy reading. They also held their first annual Amazing Shake mini gauntlet. And so fifth and sixth grade students were tested on their soft skills. And after many rounds of elimination, Hayden Willis, he won and he got a Mariners ticket. Um, at McFarland, they're starting spring sports next week. And they also had a great turnout for their last um, social kind of dance thing for the year. At DOHS, they took their second round of stamp tests. They also took eight parents to their Title I parent conference in Pasco. Um, they had their first pre-audit meeting to review their ALE program, and they were asked to add one form to all their files, which was a compliment for them. They also had Mrs. Parrish and Mrs. Mendoza go to a W-A-L-A -A conference, and they were amazed with the training that they were offered there. All their ELL students are beginning their ELPA testing. And then on the 13th, admin and counselors are going to be doing a site visit at the New Horizons High School in Tri-Cities. And so now Lauren has some stuff for OHS. At OHS, our pre-registration is starting this week. The juniors will register on Wednesday, the sophomores will go on Thursday, and the freshmen on Friday. The Crystal Apple Award presentation is March 12th from 4.30 to 5.30, and our very own Annalie Punetta is a recipient. We have the address if you, anyone, if you would like it. Um, we would like to thank the board for letting us attend the site visit at OHS and seeing what it's like. We enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Um, on Friday at noon, in front of the main gym, the drumline has a send-off for their big competition in Portland. Oh, sorry. And then um, last Monday, so a week ago, we started our spring sports. And I know that I am pumped to start. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Very Thank good. You. 
Any questions for the council? All right, thank you for that report. Uh, moving on, item C1. I will entertain a motion to approve required approvals. I motion to approve the required approvals. We have a motion by Director Prowse. Uh, I'll second, but I do have some questions. So under the accounts payables, um, there were a few things I had some questions on. Um, we're paying $1,000 to the Othello School District. Can you explain why we're doing that? So I think that's 11000 Oh, I'm sorry. What did I say? Uh, 1000 Oh, yeah, eleven. That was eleven. So we're going to have um, Amy speak a little bit about that. Okay, so we had a check made out to the school district for eleven thousand ninety six. This is going to be deposited into our certificated dental trust. The balance in the trust fund right now is fifteen thousand four eighty eight, which is not sufficient to cover the invoices for outstanding claims of twenty six thousand five eighty five. The executive team is currently working on resolving this issue, but in the meantime, claims are still having to be paid. So. It, how how is it short now when it hasn't been short in the past? So um, prior to Seb, we had our trust fund, and we have not made a deposit into that since December. That was the last payment. Okay. Um, when we started the school year, the balance on that trust fund was eighty-seven thousand. We deposited a hundred thousand three hundred and twenty. However, the claims have come in at a hundred and eighty-seven thousand eight eleven. So you're saying that that since Seb, when the state took over all of the health care, mm -hmm. uh, no money was deposited, but there's still money that needs to come out of it because it was still Correct. claims so from last a, year. It's a runoff. Okay. So we'll, and I think there might still be another outstanding invoice coming as well. Okay. So All right. Just we I hadn't seen us pay ourselves like that before, so I was curious on that one. Okay. Um, I'd like to speak on the um, the public relations and communications job, and I was hoping that we could see a, a job info that tells what the requirements would be, and um, I contacted one of the other board members. Told me that I could should call around and ask if I had questions, because um, the districts that we um, have contact are not really in our area that are, or if they are, they're a lot larger. But I contacted Quincy and they have no job in that description, but their superintendent does the same. Um, Efreda was, they were out of school and I didn't get a chance today. Uh, Warden doesn't have that job. And uh, Moses Lake does, but their rate is 50,000 to 71,000 depending on education. You have to have a three years of service knowledge and, and I wanted to compare our sheet to this sheet to see if they're kind of the same since we were offering a much larger wage. Outstanding. Thank you so much. Uh, we're going to ask Sandra if you could respond to that please. So, Uh, this position is a director position, and it is a um, bachelor's degree is required mm -hmm. in communications or a related field, such as marketing. Um, we are preferring a master's degree as well for this position. Okay. Um, yes, Moses Lake had a bachelor's degree and three years of experience. Then, then there's, uh, I wanted to compare because if we're going to be paying 20000 over the amount that Moses mm -hmm. Lake pays, I... Yeah. Um, um, I did get Moses Lake's job description as well. This, their position is, doesn't oversee um, any other staff. This position would oversee um, our front office as well. Okay. Why would we drop the ESD 123 and 112? I, I understand that's not mm -hmm. a large portion, but what, what are they doing for us that we're going to be able to drop them? Sure. I think um, Dr. Hurst can talk on that. So when we think about ESDs, both of them, 112 and 123. Can you explain what an ESD is? ESD is the Educational Support District, and they provide support to several of the local districts. So when we think about ESD 123, there's about 23 to 25 
local districts that we can go to for support. And really it is a support network. Uh, the superintendent there is uh, Superintendent uh, Wisner and we meet monthly and we uh, talk about what's happening at the state, but they also provide support to all of those districts that's within the big ESD. So ESD 123 is one of our districts, the big district, and then we have another ESD that's on the west side in Vancouver, that's ESD 112, and they provide uh, support to us currently because we did not have this type of support where they did um, communication strategies, communication planning, putting information out, uh, coordinating with uh, local media as well, and doing some social media and training and website as well. All of that information or all of those responsibilities that um, our current ESDs are providing support for, we will no longer need those, um, their help in doing that because it would all be folded into this one position. So we said, so let's eliminate those two individuals, which is Molly and uh, Monique. They've been working with us and they um, are great workers. We love their work, but it is a way for the district to save uh, some money. So $27,000 savings, because we're paying both of them about $27,000. Um, Annually? All of those responsibilities will be folded into that one position. <coughs> I'm sorry, 20, 27000 annually? Annually, yes. Okay. So that's why we would just let those individuals go. So yeah. like Molly Cassie or something from 123? Yes. Did, did you have any other questions on that? No, I had just wanted to see a comparison sheet for okay. the meeting, so. Uh, I do have one other question on accounts payable. Um, we have, Sorry. no, it's okay. I, I assume someone else was gonna ask this question. So we have a $54,000 bill to Stevens Clay and I know that that's our lawyer um, for the school district. Can you give us n just like a broad picture of like how long that's for? And that's, that's just a really large number. Absolutely. Uh, just like you said, Director Stevens Stevenson, our uh, attorney or one of our attorneys is Stevenson Clay. And that 54,000 is over a period of two months. What so covers January and February and um, as you think about uh, a district our size and just some of the issues that we have going on just specific to our district, and some other districts have these issues as well, but it really depends upon what's happening in our local district. So one of the things we do know is that there's been um, some PDC complaints that's been lodged against uh, the district. So uh, several um, conversations with the attorneys um, have really been focused on PDC. Which PDC is stands public, for? Public Disclosure, public Disclosure Commission. Commission. Thank Commission. you. Thank you. Um, so when, we, when I looked at everything overall, about 27% of the time or the expenses were dedicated to just handling those public disclosure um, issues with the commission. So those were complaints against the district. They have since been resolved, but it took you know, a lot of time and effort to um, really dive into those. Another big chunk of those expenses are public records requests, or we call them PRAs. Um, about 37.5% of those expenses were public records requests. Um, just an example, uh, to the board, I think a, a few weeks ago, or maybe a, a month and a half ago, we shared with the board uh, just the cost that is taken from the beginning of the year to now. Um, and we have ongoing PRAs or public records requests. In fact, we just had one again today. So all of that is, is a very detailed process in which we have to talk extensively with the attorney. They have to give us feedback and share with us timelines and specifically what to do. Um, but I would say most of the expenses for those two months have been on PRAs, so 37 percent. Then there was also um, some cease and desist letters. Those are letters that I shared with the, the board um, uh, confidentially, and I shared with um, the board that there are individuals that are making comments about our district that are um, libelous, meaning they're false statements. Mm -hmm. So I don't go out looking for the information. However, when it's brought to my attention, I share with the attorney um, and then we send out a letter. So that just takes some time. What? That's been a small percentage oh, of the 
of the expenses, that's only about 10%, so very small. So there's only been um, a few of those cease and desist letters. But then also, if you look across the district, every district has um, personnel that they have to deal with. Um, and some of those issues deal with um, employees being on probation or maybe even um, going to the point where there's a grievance filed based on what the union may think and based on what the district thinks as well. So I would say uh, about 25% of those uh, expenses have been on employee issues. Okay. Thank you for just clarifying exactly why. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. We did receive an email with those numbers, by the way, if you want to peruse it later. I, I did. I just, sometimes I think that we need to, that more than just the board need to understand why and where those numbers come from publicly. Any further questions? Okay, we have a motion by Director Prowse, second by Director Stevenson. All in favor to approve required approvals, aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries, five to zero. Uh, Director Stevenson, you requested the easement. To be so on this easement request, um, they used the assessed value, the current assessed value of the property, but that came from the county before the change that the city made to our zoning. And so I would like to propose that instead of approving it as the assessed value, we have it appraised and um, do a counter proposal to Cascade Gas for the assessed value. We need to have it assessed anyways if our intent is to sell. Um, and so I, I would rather wait and see what the assess, the appraised value is and not just accept the assessed value. I think that's a great idea. It should go up, shouldn't it? Yeah. Hopefully. It should work right. out from the areas around selling. Right. Yeah, it should definitely work out in our favor. All right, you're taking note of that. Yep. Okay, so if we can just uh, go ahead and get that process going and then uh, touch bases with Cascade and let them know what, what we're doing. Give them a response on that. Absolutely. Okay, moving on, we have the portable, portable bid uh, documentation. Uh, the district has uh, a recommendation uh, that we approve the lease of five portables. Uh, these would be placed at McFarland Middle School and the two that are presently on the parking lot would be moved to OHS. Before we vote on this, I would like to uh, give my two cents worth. I've thought a lot about this and I know I, I, know I mentioned this at the last uh, board meeting. Right, wrong, or indifferent, uh, aesthetically not pleasing, um, I think portables, to some extent, are going to be a, a part of the district as long as we're, we're going to be around. Um, in this case, there is a difference of about $320,000 to purchase rather than lease. I know we've had some discussions or, or conversations around the fact that we, we own some that are antiquated that just, just need to be gone. Um, so I don't know, I'm of the opinion that I think the discussion at least has to be made, uh, purchase versus lease. Um, I know that when we're gonna be working at the high school, um, when we're gonna be working at, at different schools during construction times, we're gonna need them to house folks perhaps. Um, we're in a situation now at Wahidas where perhaps we'll have to cross our fingers and renegotiate perhaps a release or, or option to buy with the lease we have. Um, so I don't know, I don't know where we're all at. I, I'm actually, I, I'd rather see us purchase these instead of lease these if we go through with this. My comment really doesn't have to do with purchasing or leasing, but I'm not sure if I'm willing to say yes for five portables for the preschool, not against the preschool, but because we have four other elementaries that are overcrowded. We're not discussing what we're gonna do there 
And yes, if, they, if they're talking about a bond, we're still talking four years plus before we can even see an elementary school. What are we doing about our other four schools that are overcrowded? I mean, so do we look at leasing more? I mean, I, I don't know. It, it's Financially, I don't think it's something that we can jump ahead and just do. I know you need to know tonight, don't you? I know. Okay. I just wanted to end the record that that's what I spoke. Well, yeah, I, I mean, I hear you on that, Sharon. At this time, I'm not under the impression that any of our elementary schools have required additional portables, have they, for the 2020-2021 school year? That's correct. So um, if they needed them, I think we would, we would get them. But right now, they, they don't need them. Yeah. Yes, I think we're all in agreement. We need an elementary school, and we've got to solve that problem. But we'll do that at our facilities. That's that's what we're be we've been doing at our facilities meetings. Um, as far as the long-term versus short-term vision, I'm with you, Mike. The long-term vision makes more sense to buy them. And then, I mean, we can always use them to replace the dilapidated ones at Scutney or at some of the other schools. But I think if we sign a three-year lease, we're going to blink our eyes and it'll be three years and we'll need them longer. So I, I, I'm on your same vision of buying versus leasing. For a three-year lease, the lease cost is 4,000, I'm sorry, $469,158 to lease for three years, five double-sided portables, so 10 classrooms, to purchase 799,000. For me, looking at those numbers, I'm definitely, up, we're, I think we should purchase. Whether, even if we could keep this plan for the three years and then move on to something else, we're always gonna need portables somewhere. Even if they sit empty for one year, we're growing. We're not gonna stop growing. So I, I think we're gonna need the ability to move portables around as needed. If they ever got empty in the first place. Should the elementary schools talk to you if they need? Do they yes, realize they, that's something they can do now? They can. They can either call myself or Pete or even Greg, any one of us. Ken, we haven't heard so, your thoughts. Two, I wanted to ask Ken what oh, his thought was on that. Two and a half years ago, we sat here and we went over the portable purchases for Wahidas. And at that time, uh, leasing, and I'm was very much for the leasing then, for leasing the, those buildings with the hopes that we would have a plan within a couple of years to have some construction uh, ideals are going on. Uh, here we are now going on the third year and now we're faced with the issue of trying to either renegotiate a lease release those buildings and which for another three years which we could have possibly purchased them uh, for the same value and, and that's I know we're in the need of five portables very much right now actually we're in the need of more portables than that to get us by uh, I think if we purchase it's going to be at least three years, I think, before any construction could be completed upon the approval of a bond. And uh, it's going to be a couple years after that. So we're looking at at least six years of uh, use of portables. And, and yes, it does make sense to purchase these more. It's going to be a, a cost savings in the future to these portables. And yes, when we do get the construction all done, get the schools up to par, we're going to be ready again for more portables. I know that. And these will be in newer condition, a lot better that we could maybe rotate some of those older ones out of the inventory and get rid of them. So at this time for savings to the district and looking into the future, I think purchasing would probably be the better option. The only thing is it takes a hit to our capital facilities budget where leasing it would uh, be absorbed through the regular budget. That's, that's the only downfall of that. 
So I think uh, what we'll do is we will, um, I think we need to vote on the, accepting the recommendation of the five portables with the distinction of making them a purchase rather than a lease. So I'd like to uh, motion that we purchase five uh, portables uh, to, be, to be placed at MMS for the preschool. Second. Okay. All those in favor of the purchase of five portables at MMS, aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. So Chris, let's five by, buy five of these instead of leasing them. Yes, sir. No problem. All right, moving on, we have uh, superintendent informational items. Um, uh, superintendent has requested uh, to be able to speak to us tonight about coronavirus. So I just wanted to share with the board and um, the public listening, there's a, a really great, great uh, resource in this website um, just for those who are listening in, uh, doh.wa.gov slash emergencies slash coronavirus. It's being updated on a regular basis, uh, so you would have to constantly check uh, just to see um, what the most updated information is. And if you can go and just scroll down a little bit, Talia, and click on where it says general information. And right where it says novel coronavirus fact sheet. So one of the best things that we can do um, is to educate ourselves about the coronavirus. And once you click on this, again, it has several languages. It talks about what is the novel coronavirus, the, the origin. Uh, it's a new virus strain spreading from person to person um, in China and other countries, including the United States. It also describes how the coronavirus is spread through breath, cough, contact. Um, it talks about how severe the coronavirus is as well. Um, and you'll hear, regardless of where you're listening, experts are still learning about the coronavirus. And it talks about the, the symptoms, uh, so fever. And from all the information that we've received, um, the key temperature is 100.4 to look for. Um, and a cough as well, and then difficulty breathing. So if you can exit out of that. Just go back to the front sheet. There's just a, a few other elements of this um, website that I want to share with you. So as she's bringing it back up, about the middle of the page, you can see the counties, and you can see those tested and positive. So go ahead and scroll down just a little bit right there. So there you can see uh, Clark County, one positive, uh, Grant County, so on and so forth, all the way down. So you can see in King County, and again, as I said, this is being updated on a regular basis. You have 116 tested positive according to the most recent information they have here on the site, uh, 20 deaths. So that is uh, an area that we want to be um, watchful for. Um, and then Snohomish as well, 37 positive. However, you have uh, one death there as well. You can also see in Grant County, they did up that, a, update that from this morning. Um, there was individual tested positive, but there was also that same individual um, who passed. So I wanted to share that with you just so you can be up to date with the latest information. And I wanted to share with you as well, we have sent some information out to our employees and also um, a letter in the mail to our parents. And that was real basic information, just trying to educate everyone about the coronavirus and just some basic tips for our, our students, for our families to constantly wash your, your hands, not touching your face as well. But I wanted to share with you just a little bit more information uh, uh, with the public and with the board. We had uh, several meetings today with um, several entities. We met with the uh, Department of Health, and we also met with uh, the city, and we also had representatives at uh, CBHA, uh, Columbia Basin, Basin Health Association. 
and was really um, great information um, provided by all those individuals, but it was really also an opportunity for us to form a task force and for us to collaborate together, that this is not an individual effort, that everyone has to play a role, and it's really about uh, prevention. But they really gave us some pragmatic steps, some practical steps that we can share with our parents and with our students and with the community members. So I'm gonna share that with you. Uh, also, I wanted to share with you that the hospital was there as well. Uh, one of the things that they shared with us this morning is that in our community, it is not widespread. It's not a widespread virus at this time, as you can see there. We're not up there, it's Adams County. Um, however, what this task force has said is that we're gonna continue to monitor and we'll continue to meet on a regular basis and we'll continue to update um, the community. So students, employees, parents, business partners, everyone, uh, we will be updating you. One of the things they shared as well is that people with 100.4 temperature um, and people who have a cough, that's what you really wanna be watchful for, is for, also if you're having difficulties breathing. And one of the key questions I did ask is, what do we share with parents if that is happening? What's next? So one of the things that they share with us very clearly is the first thing they want you to do is to call your doctor. So they shared, all of them said, they're not equipped for just this mass entrance into the clinic or to the hospital. So they asked me to communicate to the board and to our community, can we first call the doctor? Call your doctor and they will direct you on what to do and you will be called in, they wanna take care of you, and their intent is to screen out everything first, and then test as well. So I wanted to share that with you, and then just some other practical steps that they shared. One, increasing hand washing, so making sure you wash your hands. Um, if you're not around soap and water that you're using, um, a hand sanitizer that has at least 60% alcohol contained within it. They also talked about uh, building time in the day, each day for hand washing for our adults in the home, at the school, on the job. They also talked about frequently cleaning personal surfaces, desks, doorknobs, handles, et cetera. Um, for the school specifically, they spoke about enlisting students to wipe off surfaces so making sure we keep the areas clean inside the schools. They also talked about um, teaching etiquette, respiratory etiquette. So when you cough, you cough in your elbow. Um, that we refrain from the hugs and the handshakes as you saw this evening that we're doing the elbow bumps. They also talked about um, this practice called social distancing. So keeping about six feet away. Um, that's something we're gonna have to think about as a district, especially in <laughs> arm's length away. Um, one of the things that we'll provide to the board and to the public more about, because one of the things that we're gonna do since we've had all of these um, great informational meetings today is we'll be now putting out some very specific step-by-steps on what will happen for us in Othello if there is an outbreak. What are our next steps? What do we do um, with the individuals? But one of the things that um, I'll be sharing more intimately with the board as we meet um, more about this, and hopefully tomorrow, we're trying to schedule some meetings with you um, about canceling trips to certain areas that are at risk. So you saw that on this map here, those areas that are at risk. And then really, watching how we assemble in large groups as well. But I'll share more uh, with the board individually tomorrow when we talk about that. Um, the other piece that we um, spoke about is daily regular cleaning of our facilities. Um, so Greg was in that meeting. Um, he's all on top of that. And then also our buses. And Marion was part of that meeting as well. And again, our intent is to now uh, make sure that we get out to the public and to everyone, to be quite honest, 
what our step-by-step -step process is going to be, and what happens in Othello if there is an outbreak or if we do have to close the school. So that information is coming. Um, we should see that um, by the end of this week. So I just wanted to update the board on that. Very good. Thanks for that, Chris. No other items under superintendent informational items. Moving on, C5, we have a pre-approved presentation to the board from the superintendent, superintendent staff. We have our uh, high school annual report from OHS. I'll let Mr. Vergara introduce his team and they can tell us what's going on at OHS. You're going to need to turn that on, Mr. Vergara. Thank you for the invitation. Like I said, I had seen some of our staff members in the audience, but I think they have left us. But thank you, um, and thank you for coming to OHS on um, on um, March the third. It was a fun uh, experience. I think we have um, we can say that we have great um, student representative groups that were um, uh, invited to the occasion. We chose a very representative uh, sample of our student population. We also had. Um, quite a few parents in attendance, and we also had uh, a great number of staff in attendance. So thank you again for coming. And let's start out with, um, I guess, the pictures that you show that makes up um, Othello High School. Uh, the students, of course, first and foremost, the staff at a, at a professional development um, uh, opportunity, and then the parents. And then, of course, um, graduation, which is a celebration for the whole community of Othello. To my left, um, I'd be uh, remiss if I didn't introduce to my left uh, um, Mr. James Wood, one of my assistant principals, and Mr. Uh, Scott Schwartz to my right. Thank you. Um, we aligned the presentation um, in, um, in alignment with the, the ends, and we'll start out with uh, N1. Each scholar at every grade level will perform at or above the state or district standards in all disciplines. So go ahead and move on to the next. And I'll let Mr. Wood um, take it from here for a little bit. So every spring we take a uh, ESPA test, a uh, test for math and language arts. Um, over the last few years, uh, or last year, I guess it was, I believe it was in April, it might have been late March, we did an ELA test and 45.6% uh, of our students uh, were able to pass the ESPA, were able to meet the standard in language arts and 196 in uh, in math. Over the last uh, few years, we've uh, slowly uh, been dropping our percent of students score uh, passing in language arts and we've been very up and down in math This is a little bit of a disaggregated disaggregated student data it shows uh, primarily the difference between our white and our Hispanic students now obviously our school is much more diverse than just white and Hispanic but the state of Washington um, suppresses the data on any student group of under 30 individuals. And it's a matter of privacy. If there was uh, just a couple of people in one demographic group and they put out their test scores, it'd be pretty easy to divine uh, who that student was, and that would be a, a, a pretty big violation of trust, I think. But uh, in general, it does show that our Hispanic students lag behind our white students by uh, about 30% in ELA and what is that, about 30, 35% in math. We also have uh, a little bit of gender disparity, a little, little less than uh, ethnic disparity, but in gender disparity, we're running just under 40% of our males passing ELA and uh, 53 uh, and a little bit over um, for the females. So we have about a 13-14% uh, difference there. And in math, it's a little closer, 17.4 to 22.6. Um, I guess I should have had Scott do that so he could do the math quicker. But I'm counting on my fingers under the table, sorry. Um, but we do have uh, a bit of a disparity there. So the next slide is, uh, what are we doing? 
So there are several things that we're working on at Othello High School. Uh, one of the things we started last year is called the Attendance Challenge. At the end of each quarter, what we do is we offer a pizza party for the class, so freshmen, sophomores, juniors, seniors, that have the best attendance for that, um, that uh, nine-week period. And uh, what we've seen over the last three years is we've seen an increase of a little over 2% from approximately 91.5% to approximately 93.5% currently. And so what we're trying to do is to make sure that our students are aware that we want them at school, we want them there every single day. Um, being in a classroom makes it a lot easier for our students to, um, to learn, obviously, and to, so that we can challenge them for the next step of their, of their career, whether it's in the high school, uh, the following year, or college, or for work. Uh, the next thing that we're doing is called end of semester interventions. And we have done this two years in a row. Um, last year, we had approximately, uh, I'm trying to remember my numbers right now. Um, we had several students that I believe we had uh, 42 students that were uh, participating in the end of the semester, semester intervention. And what that meant is that they retrieved credit. Um, they were coming to uh, classes after school from 3.45 to 4.45 for uh, three weeks. And those students that were between um, 50 and 53 percent, they went for three weeks. 54 to 56 percent, they were there for two weeks. And from, uh, 50, above 56 percent, they were there for one week. And what they did was they were able to make up credits, which reduced our uh, summer school numbers. And also in the fall, uh, helped us reduce some of the class sizes as well from two to four students uh, per class. Um, this year, we ended up with, I believe, 84 students that completed that. So there were 42, 42 credits that those students were able to recover. Um, again, for a second year in a row, we've started an after-school intervention. We also have that uh, before school as well. Um, last year, we had 13 students that, um, that were participated in that program. And um, we had 33% of those students that did very, very well. And that was kind of leading into the uh, ESPA interventions as well, is that um, overall we had uh, just a little under, well, right around 20% for math. And again, 33% of those students that um, participated last year uh, were actually able to pass the, the ESPA math uh, assessment. This year we started that tonight, and we had, I believe, uh, eight students uh, participate in that. Um, that's Monday through Thursday. We have a morning session, 7.30 to 8.30. Uh, we have four students signed up for that, and we're continually calling parents and talking to students to try to up those numbers. Uh, my goal for this year was uh, to try to reach 20 to 25 students. And if we have the same results or better than last year, that's going to produce, obviously, higher numbers for our math ESPA. Um, we also have summer school. And again, depending on how many students that we have that complete the uh, after school uh, interventions, end of, end of semester interventions, um, we have anywhere from 125 to approximately 150 students uh, at the high school level. Um, another uh, program that we have is called Can, can I pause you for a minute? So um, the end of semester interventions, you talked about the credit retrieval, and so I think that that's a great idea. How and what are you doing to increase? So you increased a little bit mm -hmm. from year one to year two. What and how are you going to do to increase that uh, the next time that that's an option? Okay. So, what we've so been and doing is that only middle of the year? Because end of the year, they'd have to go to summer school, right? right. That's all, the only option. Right. Right. Okay, so yeah, what's the plan to increase those numbers? So in, to increase those numbers, we, um, we meet with the students, it's, whether it's uh, administration or the counselors or even teachers as well. And... Um, what we do is we provide an F list to each teacher uh, every Monday. And so they have their opportunity to be able to talk with those, with those students uh, all semester long. So that way the students aren't left in the dark until it's too late. Some of those students, um, they make it up into the 60s so that way they actually pass the class. Some of the students, when we start talking to them, are in the 40s and so they increase up to the 50 percentiles so that way they can participate in that program. So. A lot of one-on-one -on -one meetings with students. Um, we also call some of our parents as well, um, trying to make sure that they're aware of it. Um, we also, with those students that we've identified that are failing or have failed that class, 
We, um, we also mail home letters as well, so we're trying to increase that. So of those options, which one it has, have you found to be the most successful to get students there? The parent, the letter home, I mean the parent call, the teacher talking to the student. Have you checked into that? As far as the, the overall effect, no, but I, I think it's, it's the, 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 the teachers talking to the students individually um, that they have in those classes and, and just meeting with them. Um, they have the best opportunity and the easiest opportunity for, for that, that contact with, uh, with the students. Okay. Um, we do have AVID, and within our AVID program twice a week, no matter whether it's uh, freshmen, juniors, sophomores, or our seniors, um, they have uh, tutorials twice a week. And usually it's in math, and so they have a very specific method in how they do that. And um, they spend the entire class period, again, twice a week uh, throughout the year, uh, being able to ask math questions or other questions. But again, math seems to be the most popular one. Um, for our second year in a row, uh, we have what's called Agile Minds. We've been partnering with them. It's a grant that we, we uh, were able to get, and we were awarded a little over $81,000. And we have a, a class uh, called uh, Intensified Algebra, and that's uh, intended for students that are one to three years behind in mathematics. And we've seen some pretty good gains with those students. Uh, last year with those numbers, those students were about 60, per 60 points uh, behind the other students with the STAR uh, assessment that we give three times a year at the high school. Um, by the end of the year, they had cut that in half. And so we are continuing with that program for a second year. Uh, we've also brought in a consultant uh, his name is Fred Rectanus. Uh, he works with TDG, which stands for Teacher Development Group. And this is his first year at the high school. We meet uh, four times a year. And the premise with that is we're trying to get more student-student discourse. Uh, we believe that if students can help each other out and teach each other some of the different math strategies, that, that is a little bit um, kind of a, I guess, a different wave or a new wave for, uh, for in education rather than standing up and, and having the teacher deliver. So. Um, I'm going to go ahead and pass this over to uh, Jim. Uh, this is for the language arts department. Uh, beginning last year, um, after the ESPA testing, we looked at the results. And one of the things that was uh, determined that we needed to do was uh, do a cross the department uh, writing rubric. Uh, rubric is sort of a blueprint for good writing. And we now have created a rubric that is used in all of the different classrooms. So it doesn't matter what classroom a student is assigned to, they're working uh, towards the same standard of writing. So there's no, you know, one teacher teaching this way, another teaching that way. We've also taken some of their uh, professional development time and some of their personal time, and they've calibrated those. Uh, their uh, scoring, so they've taken student uh, writing samples from their students, and each teacher has scored them and, they, and explained to each other why they gave it the score until they could align those within just a few percentage points of each other. So every kid that comes through Othello High School uh, Language Arts Department is being scored um, equally with every other kid in the department. Um, we are now just starting conversations with the Social Studies Department. Um, they'll be working with the, uh, the school-wide rubric to, and, uh, and soon we'll start um, uh, calibrating to take over the argumentative writing, and that's a portion that Social Studies does more often. Um, it's impossible for a language arts department to have enough writing um, to make uh, demonstrable gains in student writing ability, so it has to become a school-wide process. When you talk about um, school-wide uh, rubric alignment, are you talking about per grade, or are seniors and sophomores? The, the rubric is similar, it just ups in complexity as they go up in grade. Okay, so by sense? grade band? Yes. Okay, thank you. The, the, the rubrics are all similar, though. I mean, they each right, cover just, different yes, things. Right, yes, more just, complex yeah. with each grade level, but different. Yes, okay. ma'am. Perfect. And something that we, we're doing for the whole staff is that we're providing professional development for all of our staff due to a survey that was uh, developed by our school action team last year at our um, spring retreat. We meet as a school action team, and we kind of start the planning for, for the next year. And we developed uh, a survey that was sent out to the whole staff. 
And these are some of the offerings that they asked for. So we've offered um, professional development in uh, differentiated instruction. We offered uh, professional development in extended discourse opportunities. Um, another session was on um, implementing Socratic seminars in the classroom. And then on 316, we're going to be offering a session on providing specific feedback for student growth. And these are all um, uh, highly effective skills for all students, but we know that they're uh, critical for our students' up populations such as ELL and special ed. And number two talks about graduation and advancement. And we want each scholar to graduate with the knowledge and 21st century skills to access, to access post-secondary education or a meaningful career. And this is some of the things that we're doing um, according uh, to help us meet that goal. Two years ago, we were introduced to PBL or project-based learning, and uh, we had 16% uh, uh, of our, our teachers were trained in the summer of 2018, which is cohort one. Uh, from those teachers, we had 43% of our students that uh, participated in, um, in a PBL project. Uh, we just got the numbers here uh, in, in the fall, and we had 89% of those students that passed or did very, very well on their project, according to their rubric. Uh, over the summer of uh, 2019, we ended up uh, overall with 39% of our, our teachers being trained in PBL projects. And um, the idea behind PBL is that we are trying to get more of our students into globally uh, responsive uh, situations to where they're going to be meeting with other students rather than kind of a sit and get to what we're kind of used to. Um, we need to make sure that our students are more adept to um, uh, talking with each other and more and more student discourse. One of the initiatives that we've been following through on is uh, social emotional um, learning. Early in the year, um, created a uh, presentation uh, called the 10 things that require zero talent. And these are things that every student and every person needs to have in life to be successful. So they aren't really related to math or science or anything like that, but there are skills such as being on time for work, um, work ethic, body language, energy, attitude, passion. And so we gave a brief, brief overview of those 10 things, and now every month we're uh, focusing on uh, one of those areas with a uh, short lesson plan, um, often including a video or a reading or a discussion. Um, so students get a chance to um, participate in some student-to-student uh, -student discourse revolving around those uh, things and their meaning to them. We also uh, have begun restorative practices. Um, generally, restorative practices are uh, designed to keep students part of the community instead of separating them from the community. So the goal is to keep students inclusive instead of exclusive. You mean like if there's a behavior issue or a, a discipline issue? Right around behavior and discipline issues, yes. Okay. And we're going to go into that a little bit more later. So. Thank you. And as you know, we were recently um, recognized at a, at a school board meeting for our increase in graduation rates. And um, just some specifics as to how we went about um, getting, getting um, to 87.1% in graduation rate for our students at Othello High School in four years. We have the program uh, that we call um, Adopt a Senior, where uh, seniors who are in peril, they get paired up with a, uh, a staff member that they trust. And uh, that staff member then is asked to counsel the student, to guide the student, to, to give a scolding to the student if that's what's needed but uh, to get them to cross the, uh, the finish line. We also continue to work on relationships, and I think that Adopt a Senior program is a, is a good testament of the, the relationships and the cashing in of those relationships that have been developed for the last four years. Um, we also have a, what we call uh, senior ranking meetings, 
where the counselors and administration sit in the conference room, and the counselors each have a caseload of seniors who are slated to graduate uh, this year, and we look at where they are, uh, what they need to be able to graduate, did they fail any classes for a semester, what interventions do we have for them, what can we do. I also, from the F list, I meet personally with all of the seniors who are failing, who are showing up on that F list. And then um, when we have to, um, we meet with parents, uh, especially early on when uh, there are some students who are really in peril of not uh, reaching that, um, that goal of graduation. We meet with the parents early on and we let them know this is exactly what needs to happen for your child to be able to graduate. And we put it all on paper and then we sign a document that says, we all know the student is present, the parent is present, the counselor is present, and the administrator is present. So everybody knows what their, their part is to get to see that to fruition. Early on, like? We start like in October. Okay. Yeah, October, when we put out the, um, put out the, uh, the adopt a senior list for the first time. A little bit more just about uh, the PBL um, process. So PBL, again, project-based learning, this is our gold standard. We have a lot of our teachers that already have uh, projects built into their curriculum, but when we were introduced to PBL, we wanted to make sure that we followed this design. Uh, first of all, uh, if they didn't have one, then we, they would be, the teacher would be designing and planning their project. Uh, we want to we'd want to make sure that they're aligned to the current standards. Um, then what we're going to do is to try to build that culture within the classroom, which again is a lot different than kind of standing and delivering. And again, we're trying to get more student student interaction, student student discourse, trying to get them more on a on a global level uh, for some of the things they're going to be seeing outside of high school. Um, then the students, what they do is they start uh, organizing their activities, putting their ideas together. Um, it's a great way to scaffold student learning because we have all kinds of different uh, learning levels within the same classroom. Um, towards the end, uh, well, I shouldn't say towards the end, all the way through the project, the teacher is assessing students. Students also will assess each other, whether it's within their groups or uh, different groups. And the, uh, the teacher and the students are always encouraged to help each other out and coach each other through the, through the PBL project. So this is a wheel for social emotional learning and as students uh, grow and move up in age, the uh, context and the areas that social emotional te teaching covers, and we talked a little bit about that. By the time we get up into the high school, we're looking at self-awareness, self-management, responsible de decision making, uh, relationship skills, and social, or social awareness. So we're broadening it from that uh, younger controlling your emotions and that. We still work on that, but we're also looking at bigger picture post-graduation skills. Uh, next slide. So this is a, uh, there's, a there's not a firewall between social emotional learning and restorative practices. They, they sort of go hand in hand. And this is a behavior reflection uh, tool that I developed um, a number of years ago. And I use it um, in conferences and small groups with students. And so the, uh, the behavior in question sort of goes in the middle. Um, one of the primary beliefs in restorative practices that students' behavior is not a reflection of who they are, but a reflection of what's happened to them. And so when, we when an inappropriate behavior happens, we have to go back a step and find out why that behavior happened. And so the first question, if you believe in restorative practices, the first, first question has to be, what happened to you? And so the student has to become aware of that and be able to define it and articulate it. Um, and that's sort of the arrows in. And then uh, the arrows out are the consequences of my behavior. And that necess doesn't necessarily mean um, the punishment for my behavior. Consequences and punishment, I think, often shouldn't go hand in hand. Consequences are quite different than punishment often. And so once the student learns why they behave that way and what the behavior was, then they start to have to look at 
how does that behavior make them feel? What are they getting out of it? Um, how, is, how does my behavior affect others? What harm did I cause? And then uh, other consequences, and that including, including the uh, student coming up with an idea of how they can repair that harm. And so that can be a, a number of interventions there. Sometimes it's a, a letter of apology. Sometimes it's a personal sit down. Um, just a variety of those things. And all this is done in an effort to keep the student from being excluded from the classroom or even excluded from the school. Thank you. Uh, once again, uh, just to celebrate our graduation rates steadily um, going up. And uh, even more proud of the fact, if you go to the next slide, that um, we have closed that graduation gap. And if you look at that um, uh, graph, you have um, the light green, blue, uh, that would be representative of the, uh, the Hispanic population at Othello High School. And then the, uh, the kind of pinkish color is the, uh, the white population um, at Othello High School. And noteworthy of saying is that both populations are increasing in their graduation uh, rates. If you look at the lines in 2014, the white student population at Othello High School was graduating at a rate of 87%, and our Hispanic population back then in 2014 was graduating at a rate of 67%. So we have closed, um, almost closed that gap. Uh, there's a little bit of a gap also with the, uh, the females and the males that we're working on on also uh, closing, and, and we're doing that as a staff, one student at a time, and it's a concerted effort of everybody involved, the, par and the parents at the home, uh, the students at our school, and of course the staff every day getting it done in their classrooms. And three, uh, talks about personal responsibility and citizenship, where each student has the knowledge and takes responsibility for his or her academic success. Next slide. And Mr. Schwartz is in charge of attendance. So as we see right there on, on the top graph where it says federal race and ethnicity, we can see that we have been steadily increasing uh, our average uh, attendance at Othello High School. Um, by definition through OSPI, uh, this, this data comes for if students have two or more absences per month, um, and that includes uh, excused and unexcused absences. Uh, if you look at last year's attendance, we actually uh, were above the state average by a little over 3%. So again, encouraging students uh, the, with the attendance challenge, uh, talking with students in the hallways, um, a lot of different things, trying to build relationships with students, letting them know that we want them in school. The old saying goes, um, if you miss school, then you miss out, and we're trying to make sure we get every student accounted for. So under that realm, if a student misses more than two days, there are no for OSPIs. Correct. Then they take that over the year, or and then they take every month. How how does this become a yes or a no? Like if I miss three one month and two the next, and then yeah, one over the year. Over the year. Over, over, over the school okay, year. Okay, I see. Okay, thank you. And um, to end, we did a little comparison in discipline data between um, last year and this school year. Um, noteworthy of mentioning is the fact that we have seen a, a large increase in our gang activity um, offenses at Othello High School. And we deduced, we surmised that that also brought um, an increase in, in, in drug offenses an increase in fighting, and also an increase in um, HIV uh, reports and offenses. What does HIV stand for? Um, harassment, intimidation, and bullying. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I heard HIV. Sorry. HIV. Other things HIV. that were already on the mind, Sorry. so I was HIV. really confused. <laughs> gotcha. Thank you.
This is a, a one-page sample of a, a four-page uh, discipline matrix. We go f uh, level one through level four. Level one are generally uh, behavior infractions that a teacher would take care of in their own classroom, minor infractions. And level four is uh, infractions that we would most certainly call uh, law enforcement in on. So I wanted to pick something sort of in the middle to, uh, to show how we have a, a progressive discipline policy. Um, depending on the severity and the, the issue at hand, uh, there'd be a number of interventions. The first one would be um, a refocus, uh, an evening school, and that becomes progressively more, and a restorative action, sorry. And then intervention two and intervention three would pro progress. Um, by the time we get to four, we'd be considering either extended evening school or an out of school suspension. Um, so it takes quite a bit to get to that point. Could you give us an example of a restorative action? It says refocus evening school one to three days for intervention one and assign a restorative action. I can. So just the other day, I had a teacher that reported um, a student had uh, pulled a, a young woman's hair. And later in the class period, the student had uh, hit the, the, uh, the other student in the back. And so they were brought into the office um, separate. separate. Um, and I talked to uh, each student individually. And uh, I talked to the boy, and I said, the young man, I said, you're, you're like, in 10th grade, <laughs> you're pulling hair. And he said, oh, I don't know what to do, I don't know what to say. And I was like, well, say the truth. And he said, somebody threw something and it got stuck in her hair and she didn't notice it and no one told her. <laughs> so I took it out of her hair. Well, later that day, or a few minutes later, I talked to the girl, sort of a debriefing, and I said, why did you hit this kid? And she said, <laughs> Uh, those of you who know me know I get pretty emotional about this stuff. So anyway, the girl said that my family's been going through some difficulties. We had to move into a new house. I share a bedroom with all of my siblings. I sleep in a bed with my two sisters, and my older sister pulls my hair at night. It had nothing to do with him. Technically, if we had just followed the manual, that would have been an exclusion from the classroom or the school. But using, uh, sorry, using this technique, we were able to get two students that figuratively walked out hand in hand talking to each other. So. Thank you. Thank you. And that's a good example of um, restorative practices and how we're utilizing that at Otello High School. And then um, uh, next week, I believe, we're attending a uh, two-day institute in, in, in restorative practices so that we can continue to, to push that philosophy at Otello High School so that we can keep the students in the classroom. Any questions? Any comments? Thank you. Go Huskies. <laughs> Very good. Thank you for that report, and uh, thank you for the hospitality on the, the other day. Um, appreciate the fact that you know everybody was open to have discussions with us and uh, it was a good visit thank you very much for the work you guys are doing thanks so much thank you. okay moving on to item d1 assurance of organizational performance we have a couple of monitoring reports that uh, hopefully we we took the time to read through and i will entertain uh, a motion to accept these monitoring reports I move we accept the monitoring reports. We have a motion from Director Stevenson. A second. Second by Director Prowse. Any discussion? All in favor of approving monitoring reports for EL 12 and EL 16, aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries five to zero. E, policy review. There's several items in there. Um, there are, well, there's at least two of them that are final readings. So if someone can motion the acceptance of both the final readings in one motion, just to save ourselves some time. I will make that motion. Do you want me to read out like EL7 or you just want me to motion to approve both of the final readings? Uh, call them out by there. Okay. Um, I make a motion that we approve EL7 and BSR3 in their state as is, the final reading. We have a motion by Director Prowse to approve the final readings of EL7 and BSR3. Can I get a second? 
I will second that. Seconded by Director Johnson. Any discussion? All in favor, aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. We have uh, GP7 that uh, is the first reading. And in it, under required approvals, we'll see in the red um, a change that needs to happen to this GP to be able to approve the other. Uh, basically, we would be removing uh, the monitoring reports, re response documents from this section of this GP to be able to have it in required approvals. Or it's, am I reading it incorrectly? It's coming out of. Yeah, I think you're right the way you said it. Okay. Yeah, it yes. goes right into required approvals instead. Okay. So I'll entertain a motion to approve those changes. But we can't, well, so typically in the past, we haven't approved it when it's revised. We've said whether we're all happy with the state that it's in, and then we it comes back next time as our final reading, correct? I, don't know. I thought it was just Is this because deal. it says revised, but I think that this is a first reading, and we don't typically do it okay. off of the first reading. No problem. It'll come back next week as a final reading. If we're all happy with the new wording, I I'm great with it. Yeah, yeah, I think we did. We, that's what we want to happen. The intent was to be able to modify the other. Right. Sharon, or I, we've all nodded our heads. And Okay, sorry. I just okay, that will be in our, uh, ne at our next board meeting as a final reading. GP 7.2. So I had done this a, a week or a last meeting or two, and it, it's just clarifying where that goes um, because it was written to a thing that it doesn't apply anymore. Okay, so this so can come back as well as a... As a final, a final. for the next. They kind of go together. Yes. So. I'm getting mostly nods. Yes. yes. Okay. Uh -huh. This will come back also next week, or two weeks from now. And has anybody had a chance to read through GP 7.3? And. <laughs> uh, okay. We will. We will just continue to bring this back. Uh, I am. I mean, one of the things that, and I think I mentioned this last time, and it is under the process at the meeting, the fourth bulletin where uh, the board limits the time devoted to all public comments to 30 minutes. I'm trying to somehow, I, I, I know we have to have a limit of some kind. Uh, you can strike that. I, we I'm trying can to discuss just it. I mean, what, I'm, what I'm trying to get at is, is to maybe expand it to, for the wording to re reflect perhaps the type of public comment or the meeting or if there's I mean I'd hate to box ourselves into having 20 people here that that absolutely want to say something and because our policy says that we limit it to 30 minutes we don't we're not inclusive of everyone having a voice what if we changed it to public comment at regular board meetings uh, would you be okay with the 30 minute thing if it's at a regular board meeting because if we have like a meeting where we want to talk to the whole community. We call it. We don't call it a board meeting. We call it a community forum, or we call it typically a different name. Yeah, no, no. But this, as it, as it reads, we're we're referring specifically to to, to tonight to, to tonight's public board. comment. Mm -hmm. uh, we're asking them to by six forty five have the sign in sheet in sheet in, and again, well, I think just continuing to read this and, and trying to it's a verbiage thing is what it is, uh, and I'm just trying to be inclusive of. of giving as many people possible. Like I said, I, I'd hate to uh, show up one day and tell 10 people, well, flip a coin or something, because we have this policy right, in place. Right, I, I would be totally fine with taking that out. Okay. I mean, I, I'm not, you're not offending me when no, we can... not trying to either. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right, Talia, if we can just uh, bring this back to the next board meeting as well, and if we can well, continue. What does, what does everybody else think? I mean, are we ready to take that line out? Or do we I, need to discuss, think I'm ready more? I'm to take that line out, and then also I have a question that on the 
part where it says to have them in by 645 tonight's a good example that wasn't going to work very no, well. No, it says a sign-up sheet is available Available. usually by 645. Okay. Not that they have to be in, okay. that the sign-up sheet is usually out by that time. It doesn't address that. Okay, so are we are we in agreement then that we can strike the the, the bullet with the thirty minute yes. limit? Yes. Okay, that's one change there. If there are any others that you want explored or talked about, please let the Leah know, and uh, it'll stay there till we can come to consensus as to exactly what we want. But with that line striked that, for next time. At least so revised one, at least instead revised of the first reading. That not right. be there. All right. I, I need to go back just on one, and I know we already approved it, but the question's going to come up later tonight under our survey monkey. There's one here that is going to affect Dr. Hurst. It's EL7, but that's, did we ask him his uh, interpretation of it? before we finalized it. Dr. Hurst, what is your interpretation of the final reading of EO7? Thanks, Ken. Yes, yeah, so I'll just recap um, what I shared at the last uh, board meeting. We really talked about um, maintenance, so making sure that we have a short-term and a long-term maintenance plan for the district. Um, and really, uh, what I didn't say last time is that second bullet what talks about future financial plans for the maintenance. So I left that out inadvertently, but we are responsible also for making sure we have financials attached to that maintenance plan. Very good. Okay, uh, we will have a at least five minutes, please. Five minute or recess, uh, and we will uh, go into an executive session. The board will go into an executive session for 15 minutes to consider the selection of a site or acquisition of real estate by lease or purchase. So we'll meet. There will be no action. No action taken. We will meet at 9.05.
go. All right, we are out of executive session. Moving on to our meeting, item G1. Uh, we have a uh, public uh, upcoming events, uh, several on there. Uh, March 10th, there's a pre-festival pre band and choir concert, MMS at 7. The 14th, drill team is at districts. The 17th, audit entrance meeting. Uh, location says to be determined. Will it not be here, Chris? Yeah, I just wanted to say that board members are not supposed to be here tonight. It will be Jim Bolden. If there is staff issues, I'm sure you know what to do. Okay, and that will be the 17th. Do we have an idea? I know I said I would be here. I said I would be here as well. Yes, okay, so there's at least three. So more than likely here. Okay, March 19th, Hi Hiawatha Spring Concert, MMS Auditorium at 7. Uh, March 19th, uh, PAC meeting, OHS corridor at 6 p.m. Uh, 20th to, through the 22nd of March, Sand Hill Crane Festival at Othello High School. Moving on, board self-assessment. Let's fill the survey monkey. I did ask the student reps that I, I at least I informed them that they could fill this out before they left. So I think we got theirs as well. Okay, so. All right, there's seven responses. General, um, general meeting behavior rate, the board's meeting behavior by assigning a numerical rating using the following scale. The agenda was well planned to focus on the real work of the board. Uh, seven said commendable. The board followed, followed its agenda and did not allow itself to get sidetracked. One said satisfactory, two said good, four said commendable. The board's deliberations and decision making processes were public. Seven said commendable. All board members participated in discussion. No one dominated. One said satisfactory, two said good, and four said commendable. Members listened attentively, avoiding side conversations. One said good, six said commendable. Um, governance principles review. Board actions occurred at a policy level rather than an operational level. Seven said yes. The board agenda referenced a uh, policy topic about, referenced policy about each topic that was discussed. Uh, six said yes, one said not applicable. The board chair helped the board officially conduct its meetings. Seven said yes. The board supported the superintendent in any reasonable interpretation of policies. Five said yes, two said not applicable. We think, I think I know who the two not applicable were. They're not here, <laughs> I think. Um, newer modified policies. There's uh, a comment there. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, I'm the board, the board started started with a broad statement and became more detailed in a logical and disciplined sequence. Four said yes. Three said not applicable. The board asked the superintendent to provide his reasonable interpretation of the policy. Six said yes. One said not applicable. Thank you, Ken, for making sure we are following our policies. Yes, thank you very much, Ken. 
So overall, uh, we had two said it was a good meeting, four said it was commendable. Uh, having concluded all our business, this meeting is adjourned. <laughs>